Thank you all for coming uh, to this afternoon event. My name is Scott Stroud. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Communication Studies. I'm the Program Director of Media Ethics for the Center of Media Engagement. And the Center for Media Engagement loves to do research and hold events that encourage a more engaged, intelligent, and reflective democratic society. And part of that, or at least my part of that, has to do with ethical reflection on issues in new media, technology, journalism, and so forth. So today, this talk is part of the Media Ethics Speaker Series, and we have a real treat. The university just launched, or publicly announced, uh, the launching of its Good Systems Initiative, and we happen to have the chair of this initiative giving the first fall Media Ethics Speaker Talk uh, on behalf of the Center for Media Engagement. Before I get to the speaker and his virtues, and more importantly, let him speak, I'd like to encourage you to follow the Media Ethics Initiative on Facebook, at Media Ethics Initiative. Uh, you should dredge up only one page for us, as well as on Twitter, Ethics of Media. Uh, we, in this way, you can find out all of our future talks. We tend to like to have a variety of topics throughout the semester. We uh, produce talks, case studies, events on things in digital ethics, journalism ethics, uh, et cetera. So this semester, for instance, we have an upcoming talk on Me Too and journalism ethics, and a talk on the great debate between Baldwin and Buckley in the 1960s on civil rights. So we have a wide variety of topics, something everyone can get into and like, uh, all with the same goal, encouraging more public reflection and research on normative topics in the media. So today's speaker will help us do just that when it comes to the wonderful thing called artificial intelligence, or AI. Now, whether you have a house full of Alexa devices like I have, mm -hmm. or your Apple phone that's always listening for a Siri command, AI is getting increasingly inserted into our daily lives, and it seems to be very useful. But what we need to do, what we must do, is continue to reflect on these types of things and wonder what are the limits for these technologies, what are the warning signs, what are the things we must try to prevent the technology from doing to us or uh, with us. So today, Dr. Ken Fleischman, a professor in the School of, U of Information here at UT Austin, is going to talk about the Good Systems Initiative on Building Ethical AI. Now, he is the inaugural chair of the Good Systems Grand Challenge, and he teaches and researches on a variety of topics in ethics and digital media. I encourage you, if you are a University of Texas student and looking for some exciting classes to take on the cutting edge, Dr. Fleischman is one of those professors you should seek out. So with no further ado, I will turn over the floor to Dr. Fleischman. He will speak for around 30 or 40 minutes, and we'll have plenty of time for discussion after this. So uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Fleischman. Awesome. Thanks so much, Scott. It's great to be here at the Center for Media Engagement in the Moody College of Communication. Uh, Scott mentioned I'm uh, uh, at the School of Information, so uh, down Guadalupe about uh, 10 blocks or so. <laughs> Um, and uh, but we're really excited about the the launch of good systems um, so this is as of Wednesday um, at the State of the University address uh, President Fenvis uh, officially is the audio not good so at the uh, State of the University address which is actually where uh, in uh, three years ago, uh, President Fenves announced the Bridging Barriers Grand Challenge Initiative, which was to be a series of Grand Challenge projects that would drive the direction of research across the campus for the next decade um, that uh, he announced in the 2019 State of the University Address, uh, the third Grand Challenge, Good Systems, um, which will ensure uh, work to ensure the needs and values of society drive the design of artificial intelligence technologies. So it's really exciting this topic has come to the forefront. It's something that we're talking about these days. Part of this is a result of the way that the uh, Office of the Vice President for Research uh, organized uh, the Bridging Barriers Grand Challenges um, in a very bottom-up way. Um, so making sure uh, not just to be uh, the upper administration sitting around in a room deciding what the topics would be, but actually getting involvement from a, a wide range of folks from across campus, including students, researchers, postdocs, faculty, staff. Um, and so they had a, a white paper competition to uh, produce some ideas. They used that to identify some themes that cross cut across the different units. A uh, big part of this is to make these really campus-wide interdisciplinary projects. There's a tendency for siloing, uh, certainly within departments, 
um, and uh, especially between uh, schools and colleges, often not a, you know very few opportunities for interaction. It's fun to get to come over here and, and talk with y'all, um, but we're trying to make this more the norm and less just the exception. Um, so bridging barriers are um, bridging uh, barriers between fundamental knowledge and real world problems by connecting disciplines, techniques, and ways of thinking. Um, you can think of it as one of NSF's ten big ideas: convergence research trying to bring together different disciplines, and not just multidisciplinary, not just having a bunch of people from different disciplines all in a room together carving up a problem, saying, uh, she'll do that, he'll do that, they'll do that, uh, but rather we're trying to really grapple with these issues on a fundamentally interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary level. So we're trying to converge our research approaches. That comes from, you know, being having a very broad view of research and scholarship, which you know, in the humanities, the social sciences, technical fields, there are vastly different traditions. So you have to have folks who are open to other ways of doing things, um, other modes of, of scholarship. And uh, it takes time. Um, so we've benefited from this time that we've had to uh, ramp up and develop good systems. Uh, we think that it has uh, the potential to do really great things, and it's already been getting a lot of buzz from the development folks um, and their interactions with folks in industry and foundations uh, so that we see a lot of uh, potential for good systems. Um, these are broadly interdisciplinary teams. So um, on the executive team, there are eight of us. We're from six different uh, colleges, schools, and units. So uh, we have uh, Sharon Strover from the Moody College of Communication from the School of Journalism on the executive team. Um, my colleague Matt Lees is on the executive team. Um, he's uh, also in the, I school, in the School of Information. Uh, we have uh, Sam Baker and Tanya Clement from the Department of English within the College of Liberal Arts. We have Peter Stone from Computer Science within College of Natural Sciences. Uh, Chandra Bhatt from uh, Civil Architectural and Environmental Engineering within the Cockrell School of Engineering and our chair elect, because the chair is a rotating position, I'm the inaugural chair, I kind of get it going, but then I want to hand off and make sure we have some new energy driving us every year, uh, will be Jun, Junfeng Zhao from the School of Architecture. Uh, we'll be uh, taking over the leadership uh, next year. So it's exciting to um, get to work with such a really talented and diverse uh, set of folks with, from very different perspectives representing the humanities, the social sciences, and technical fields. Um, so these are moonshot goals. Um, so we're trying to take a real societal problem, as I'll give some examples of why AI ethics today is a real societal problem. I think in the aftermath of Cambridge Analytica and the 2016 election and many different things that you can see today, you can see why this uh, is a topic that is attracting a lot of buzz that many universities are focusing more on, and we really want Texas to be the place for doing research on ethics of AI. Um, so we want to uh, leverage the interdisciplinary research community across the campus to solve this big societal problem. Um, and so this is in the context, uh, Planet Texas 2050 was the first grand challenge to launch, uh, then whole communities, whole health. Good Systems is the third and final of the uh, Bridging Barriers Grand Challenges to launch. Uh, designing AI technologies that benefit society is our grand challenge. Um, so collaborating units, I mentioned that I, I mentioned the, the members of the executive team, but that was just the start. Uh, so we actually have uh, at least 24 uh, departments and units uh, represented in our network of folks who are involved in and funded by research uh, for good systems. Um, and actually, I, I looked through our list, and there are people that I know should be on there that we still need to add. So it's an incomplete list, so there might actually be a couple omissions. Apologies in that case. But you can see from this broad range, um, you know, hopefully you'd expect the School of Information, the Department of Computer Science, uh, Moody College of Communication vis-a-vis -vis journalism here, uh, but uh, also folks in astronomy, uh, folks in uh, rhetoric and writing, Slavic and Eurasian studies, which makes sense, again, given the, the context of how uh, AI is being uh, leveraged and applied in real-world situations today. Um, and it was exciting um, 
the uh, president highlighted three of the eight uh, cluster hire initiatives that are going on this year that were selected from among, uh, you know, they got a whole bunch of, of folks who proposed uh, cluster hires and they selected eight and one of them is within good systems and another is largely an offshoot of good systems. So both Sharon Strover and I were involved in, in both of those and we have new hires going on in both Moody College of Communication and in the School of Information as a result. Um, so it's an exciting, you know, this is quite a range of folks you can imagine across uh, that spectrum. Um, and the, the grand challenge we're trying to solve is that uh, one part of it is that those who develop AI don't always fully consider the ethical and societal implications of their technologies. So it's really critical that uh, AI developers think critically. Um, it's when I teach, so I'm teaching currently a course, uh, Ethics of AI, Theorizing Good Systems. I'm teaching it within the School of Information currently, but I'll be uh, converting it into a signature course and teach, co-teaching it with uh, Jinfeng Zhao in the spring. Uh, when I teach that course or any other um, IT ethics courses, my goal is not to turn bad people into good people. <laughs> First of all, I mean, my, my experience has been most students um, in your field and ours uh, tend to be pretty good folks with good intentions in the first place, um, uh, especially when it's an elective ethics course uh, that further self-selects in that manner. Um, and, and even if I did have a bunch of evil people in my class one semester at this point in your lives, it'd be very unlikely that we'd have much of an impact. Fortunately, that's not the case. Um, so it's not that, that technologists are, uh, the, the real problem is not that the majority of technologists are evil, malicious people who are trying to do things wrong, destroy the world, cause problems. Uh, it's much more that technologists don't always think through the societal implications of the technologies that they're developing. Often not until far after those technologies have already been deployed. And at that point, it may be too late to correct, course correct, or to uh, fix the situation. There's no point in closing the barn door after the horse has already left. Um, so um, it's really critical. So uh, Langdon Winter has a concept, he calls this technological somnambulism, sleepwalking through technology. The idea that often when you're designing a new technology, how should I do this? Well, I'll do it the way I learned. I'll do it the way everyone else does it. I'll do it the way it's expected not thinking critically about what are all the options, who are all the stakeholders who might be impacted by this technology, and how could I try to design this technology to work best for the stakeholders who are gonna be affected by the technology. So it's really critical to take that moment of reflection and think about the societal implications. That requires more than just a technical skill set. It requires a socio-technical skill set of humanistic social science and technical thinking. Which, for which it's important to have an industry team to be able to uh, try to solve this problem and, and develop materials in part that then, uh, you know, our long-term goal is that folks coming out of uh, Moody, coming out of CS, uh, coming out of the School of Information are going to have the broad interdisciplinary perspective to be able to consider the ethical implications of the technologies they're developing as they're doing it, not just retrospectively afterwards. The flip side of this is on the society side, that folks like lawyers and policymakers may not fully understand AI's role in society. Frankly, everyday people may not even always be aware of the cases in which AI is being deployed in making decisions. Um, so if you have applied for a job at uh, Walmart or Target or what have you, you probably assume, well, a person reviewed my application and rejected it. Um, it's quite possible, maybe even likely, it was actually an algorithm that reviewed it and rejected it. So in many cases, we're not even aware of uh, when AI is being deployed or how it's being deployed. Another example of this, if anyone watches uh, tennis on television and are familiar with the Hawkeye system, the Hawkeye system is um, basically there are a whole bunch of cameras around the court and they're feeding all these different camera angles into a computer model, into AI and the AI is making a prediction about whether the ball was in or out based on these different uh, trajectories they can see from the different camera angles. 
Uh, but even John McEnroe, who's, as you probably, for anyone who follows tennis, especially, you know, old school, um, is aware, had a bit of a temper, uh, wasn't always the referee's uh, best friend. Uh, but even John McEnroe will say, oh, Hawkeye says it's in. End of discussion. Uh, no consideration of the possibility that there might be a margin of error with this technology, with the, which there is. But uh, in a lot of cases, we're willing to allow the fact that we've automated a process to assume a degree of fairness and impartiality is occurring that may be a projection, that may be, unfortunately, an overestimate. Um, another example of this is in the uh, aftermath of the 2000 election um, in the Florida recount. Um, remember, this is the hanging chads and what have you, um, that uh, when they did the manual recount, there were a lot of commentators, a lot of folks going around, wringing their hands. Um, how can we let humans do this? Humans have political affiliations. Humans have the, you know, emotions, have their values, have their beliefs. How can we trust humans to be impartial and fair and objective the way that a machine is? That assumption that machines are inherently fair or objective is often highly problematic. Uh, it's, uh, it's reminiscent of the Richard Braudigan beat poem, All Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace. Uh, but I think it's very important to be aware of the role that AI has an impact in your, uh, in your life as a first starting point to empowering everyone in, in taking control of how AI is being used and make sure we don't turn into a technocracy. Um, so how can we ensure that advances in AI are compatible with and responsive to society's needs and values? That's what we're trying to solve in good systems. So, um, so uh, one of the theories that we're applying here is uh, Kranzberg's laws, and specifically his first law of technology. Technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. Um, so there's a tendency to think of that sort of neutrality um, aspect, but technology can have good or bad implications for particular stakeholders in particular situations. It's very context-based. So you, you typically can't make a blanket claim about such and such technology is a good technology, or such and such technology is universally a bad technology. But it's also problematic to say such and such technology is neutral. Typically, they're going to have some kind of impacts, but those impacts are far more complex. And that's, that's what makes it hard. If technologies could be labeled inherently as like good or bad for all people in all circumstances, that would be awesome. But there are very few technologies you could ever uh, come up with. We've had trouble coming up with any universal moral laws for thousands of years. Typically, people will say, thou shalt not kill is a fairly universal law. OK, how about the battlefield? When does life begin? When does life end? It gets really tricky to actually figure out the, you know, anything that we claim to be uh, a universal rule. It's, uh, you know, we can come up with situations that can challenge and, and blur the boundaries there. Um, so uh, the examples here, you know, in the first example is uh, what I think of as a really positive implication of advances in IT, which is, for example, the ability to track the direction of a hurricane. Um, and uh, where I'm from in Galveston, we had the 1900 storm. There was one meteorologist who was going back and forth across the beach saying, you need to leave the island, it's not safe. Very few people listened, and unfortunately that was, I believe, still the deadliest natural disaster in the history of the United States. Um, so the be ability to be able to predict uh, the path of a hurricane is uh, really valuable, and you can do that either with a degree in meteorology or a Sharpie. Uh, okay. Then, <laughs> um, uh, you know, nuclear power and uh, nuclear weapons in particular is a really stark example of the potential consequences of uh, technology. And the theoretical physicists who did some of the basic research that led eventually to the development of nuclear weapons then often looked back and said, hmm, was that the right thing to have done? What were the implications of this? Could we have predicted it being applied in this way? Um, and then mobile devices, I mean, they have all kinds of good, bad, neutral, all kinds of different uh, uh, um, implications for many different folks in society and lots of potential for uh, disparate impact. Um, some highlights of AI. So the really amazing uh, 
things that AI has been able to accomplish. So we have 22 years ago, Deep Blue defeating Kasparov at chess. Uh, we have eight years ago, uh, Watson uh, defeating uh, Ken Jennings at Jeopardy, both of those being IBM uh, uh, systems. And uh, we have Uber launching their self-driving car services. Um, so there are lots of amazing things going on with technology. But there are also some lowlights. Um, so uh, if anyone's familiar with the Tay chatbot, um, this was a Microsoft chatbot. They um, had originally intended it to interact with Twitter users and learn from Twitter users and uh, basically for the Twitter users to teach and train this chatbot. The 8chan people got a hold of it, and they trained it in some pretty awful, horrific ways. Um, so it uh, was denying the Holocaust. It was uh, being very racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, just about anything you wouldn't want a technology to be, it was. Um, and they had to pull the plug after only 16 hours. Were there a bunch of uh, you know white supremacists dreaming up like we're going to release this product and this is going to happen. I highly, highly doubt that. I truly believe that the folks who de designed Tay had the best of intentions. They were trying. They, they were very genuine in their uh, in their intent, and they were hoping for the best. Unfortunately, we wound up with the worst. Um, in uh, 2018, we had our first pedestrian fatality as a result of a self-driving car. As we increasingly automate. Uh, driving, it's likely that the number of, uh, uh, you know, there'll be more and more fatalities. Now, relative to human driving, of course, we always have tens of thousands of folks tragically dying at, uh, on highway accidents, um, as it is with manual driving. If, you know, there are simple ways to solve this. We could just, uh, hard speed limit designed in technologies of one mile per hour. And <laughs> you probably wouldn't have any uh, fatalities, but you wouldn't get anywhere fast. So you always make these value trade-offs between uh, things like uh, convenience and safety. Or, uh, so that's, those are the kinds of value trade-offs that people make. So our mission is to create a framework for evaluating the societal and ethical implications of AI and to encourage the development of good systems. So it's a now or never thing. So we have a chance, we need to intervene in the development of AI technologies now while those course corrections are still possible. Um, the, the longer you wait, the more inertia and momentum that you have to overcome in order to be able to intervene. Um, so it's really critical that we do this now. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, like for a good system, part of it is good, and good is something that we've been arguing for thousands of years. What is the meaning of good? What does it mean to be good? We haven't fully solved that problem, even again after thousands of years of discussion in many cultures around the world. Um, we don't have thousands of years, most likely, to deal with the impacts of AI. We really need to fig figure this out quickly. That's why uh, this kind of an investment in this problem is, is critical to make. So we have a unique opportunity for, for UT Austin to be the leading site for research and education on the ethical implications of new AI technologies. That's, that's our goal. Um, we're trying to build human-AI partnerships. Um, that includes humanists, social scientists, and technologists. Uh, so a value can be defined as what a person or a group of people consider important in life. Um, and so to exemplify this, um, if you have folks uh, talking in a boardroom or um, in a uh, church pew or in whatever context, um, they are having a conversation but they may be thinking about and valuing different things. They may have different priorities they're trying to accomplish as a result of, of this meeting. So uh, maybe he values achievement, he values wealth, she values innovation, and he values benevolence. So different people may be interacting, but they, their behavior may be driven by different values. And typically not in absolutes, but in relative degrees of, again, how people make that trade-off between convenience versus safety, convenience versus privacy. Um, we're building on the work of Bacha Friedman and others uh, in value-sensitive design as one of the uh, frameworks that we're drawing upon. We're drawing upon the uh, critical infrastructures literature and uh, we're drawing upon socio-technical interaction networks from uh, uh, social informatics. Um, so those are just some of the theoretical groundings for the work uh, that we're doing. It's a very uh, uh, 
convergent interdisciplinary team. So there are many different framings that we bring. And the goal is, uh, so this tripartite method of conceptual, empirical, and technical, the goal is to triangulate. You know, the old notion that any one method, it's, you know, not as good as if you have multiple methods and multiple approaches that you can apply. And this maps fairly well onto the humanities, social sciences, and uh, technical fields. Um, and uh, socio-technical interaction networks then put this in the societal context. Um, Value-sensitive design comes from an HCI framework, which comes from a tradition of focusing on human-computer interaction, how most traditionally how an individual user is interacting with an individual technology. Uh, but we're dealing with complex networks of systems and people interacting. Um, and STINs are one approach for this to understand the relation uh, between technologies and people and the interactions that occur within a given socio-technical setting. So when we say good systems, systems doesn't just mean from a technical standpoint. We mean it from a socio-technical standpoint. People are part of the systems too. They should be human AI partnerships. It shouldn't just be, let's just automate everything and let technology dictate our lives. I hope we're going to maintain agency. I hope we're going to care about uh, human empowerment and advancement. Um, so this allows us to take our value networks from micro scale and get them uh, far more macro. This somewhat exemplifies the bottom-up approach that we're taking within this, building on the bottom-up approach of, of uh, bridging barriers. Um, we uh, released a call for proposals in the spring, and we selected 10 projects, a uh, total of a million dollars awarded for research in this current fiscal year. We're going to have another release of another call um, at sometime this academic year for the following fiscal year, and that's also going to be another million dollars available for research projects that will be open to anyone on the campus will be eligible to apply for that funding. And uh, the requirements, among the requirements, it needs to be an ethics of AI, uh, but it also needs to have folks from multiple CSUs, and it needs to have folks from multiple disciplines. It can't just be a computer scientist in three different departments. It has to be, have people with different training in different units. Um, so our logic model, so our mission is for AI technologies to meet the needs and values of society. And the final impacts we're trying to achieve uh, for society to be empowered to design good systems, to use good systems, and for UT to lead innovation in good systems. Um, so right now we're focused on conducting basic research, creating educational materials, and engaging the campus community. This is the first four years of our eight-year mission. Um, so constitute phase one. Um, that includes defining good systems. So what, what is a good system? What does it mean for a, a system to be good? Um, how do we, how, you know, in order to grapple with the problem, you first have to understand it, be able to define, define it, uh, both the good side and the system side. Um, the next is evaluating. You have to have some way to be able to compare systems in terms of their goodness. Uh, that may be quantitative, that may be qualitative, that, you know, there's a wide range of different approaches. It's not purely a sort of metric way, uh, but it's important that we do grapple with what are the factors that, that we can evaluate in order to figure out the goodness of a system. And the last is building good systems. Um, if you're going to define it and evaluate uh, the goodness, you want to make sure that you're then providing some best practices, tools, techniques, strategies, methods to ensure that uh, values are incorporated in the design of AI technologies. We make sure that values drive the design of AI technologies. Um, phase two is from 2023 to 2027, so uh, that's a bit in the future. That's our second four-year uh, phase. Uh, but uh, loosely what we're uh, planning to do is to engage with industry around research um, outreach to the public and government, and also think about how we need to reconfigure the academy to address a society's ethical needs. So it's really critical, and again, a lot of this should come out not only of, from uh, convergent research, but also from convergent education. Making sure that people have the mixture of training and skills to be able to think critically about the implications of the work that they're doing and what might result from the technologies they're developing. Um, so this is uh, the overall picture, our infrastructure, our education, university engagement, and external 
outreach, um, then our research, the, uh, and then uh, specifically in your uh, in phase um, phase one, and then the uh, ten projects we're funding in year one. Um, just I'll flip through these really briefly, but uh, projects include urban health risk mapping, privacy preferences and values for computer vision applications, ethical data designed for good systems, disinformation and context AI platforms and policy. Uh, understanding how African American and Latinx youth evaluate their experiences with digital assistance. Uh, bad AI and beyond, exploring how popular media shape the perceived opportunities and threats of AI. Probabilistically safe and correct imitation learning. Designing human AI partnerships for search and evaluation. Design of fair AI systems via human centric detection and mitigation of biases and building and testing machine learning methods for metadata generation and audiovisual collections. So quite the scope. And again, from a bottom-up perspective, we wanted the research community to drive the direction. What are the, the really exciting projects? What is it that really needs to be solved in society? And what's some innovative research we can do to try to come up with some solutions? Um, so those are just our year one uh, projects, and we look forward to having more exciting projects in, in the coming years. <laughs>